And the other thing that's, that's different this month is, is we want to give an opportunity for everyone to be able to, to put in um, praise and prayer requests. Um, we're going to try and do this every few months where we have this chance to, to share together uh, things that we want people to be praying for for us and our families. So there's an online form, um, looks like this, uh, and if you don't fill it in, um, nothing will appear for you uh, under you to be to be prayed for. So if you if you if you want things to be prayed for, please do fill that form in or get in touch in some other way. If you want to fill in a form, give us a ring, uh, send an email. So that's the plan for this week. And if you can get those to us by uh, the end of Tuesday, and then we'll we'll bring out the prayer news on on Wednesday. And then on Saturday, we're also going to restart our uh, in-person Saturday prayer meetings that we try and do again once we well, we used to do once a month. So that will be at 9 o'clock for half an hour on Saturday. So if maybe Wednesday night's a difficult one for you, um, let's meet together on Saturday morning for half an hour of prayer here in the chapel. And, then f uh, and also on Saturday, there's a meeting in Bethesden, Can We Trust the Bible, with Brian Edwards. Um, there's a poster on the wall at the back uh, about this. Um, Brian's a great speaker. It's uh, always an important topic. So uh, you're welcome to go to that next, next Saturday at, uh, down at Bethesden. And then just finally, one other notice, we have a members meeting in two weeks' time, and there's an agenda on the board at the back. Well, good morning to everyone. It's good to see you all again and are we on the computer as well or if anybody's watching i'm not sure if anybody's watching yeah, yeah, it's, well, it's oh. being recorded yeah all right welcome to those who are online as well so i do trust you um will be fine this morning encouraging to you and uh, i do want to begin reading a little bit from the psalm psalm 34 as we begin it says i will extol you i will extol the lord at all times his praise will always be on my lips i will glory in the lord let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Let's stand and we will sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning and we want to say thank you for the salvation that you have given to us. We want to say thank you for the opportunity to meet together. We want to say thank you again for the privilege to represent you in our world. Thank you for the health that you've given us, at least to be able to make it this morning. Father, we should be able to lift up your praises. And sometimes lifting up your praises um, reminds us that, look, we have wandered away. As we just sang, prone to wander, we feel it. And so we pray this morning that you will help us to taste and see that you are good. Help us to realize that we find fulfillment and satisfaction in you. And we know that you are beyond what we can think, what we can even imagine, the scripture says. You are beyond all of our praising. But today we come and we want to acknowledge who you are. And we want to give you the praise and the thanks that you deserve because of your loving kindness towards us. We pray that you'll help us today, meet with us this, today, and encourage the hearts of the believers and convict those who do not know you. Let them see your goodness and let your goodness draw them to you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, how many here have ever been scared of a thunderstorm? Anyone been scared of a thunderstorm? Now, um, I grew up in the Midwest of America, and so we had thunderstorms quite a lot. And so we, we got used to them a little bit. But, um, you know, when you hear thunder, or when you hear or see the crack of lightning, your heart begins to, you know, start to pound. And you, you don't know if it will happen again. You, you try to see the lightning and you listen to how close it was. You, know, you feel like maybe the windows are going to come crashing in. And when you get scared of something, what do we do? We run to a safe place. Now, I remember when I was a child, um, we had, funny enough, we had some uh, family friends staying at our place. And there was a massive thunderstorm that came through, and I got in the middle of the night, as you do when you're younger, you get scared. What do we do? We run to our parents. You know, so the big thunderstorm comes, and so I'm li- you know, I think it's probably about your age, and I stand up, I get out of bed, and I go to my parents' room, and I cuddle into the bed. They're like, I'm scared. But it wasn't them. It was, <laughs> it was a family friend. <laughs> you know, so... You take the scaredness of the storm, and then you get the fearfulness of this stranger. Well, at the time, you think it's a stranger, but you know who they are. But the stranger in my parents' room, like, it just compounds the fear and the anxiety. And finally, I found my mom. And she says, you know, you felt at that time the chaos. You can't grasp what's actually going on. You're tired. Where are my parents? There's a storm happening. But when I found my mother, she held me. She said, hey, it's okay. Don't be scared. It's only a storm, and I am here. Not there, but I'm here. (laughs) But from time to time, do you get scared? A few? A few? Anyone? We get scared. And both young and old alike, we all get scared. The same is true for people in the Bible. Jesus' closest friends got scared. You might know the story from Mark chapter 4. But the scripture says that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. And he left the crowd behind him and they took him along just as he was. He was in the boat and there were also others in the boat with him. And the furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now Jesus was in the stern. He was sleeping on a cushion and the disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care? If we drowned. Well, Jesus, he said, it says he got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to the disciples, 
Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? So in this story, Jesus' closest followers were scared out of their mind. They were literally thinking they were going to drown. What did Jesus do? Well, he simply spoke to the storm, and he told it to calm down. And it did. But here's what I want to point out to us today. Even the young ones, specifically the young ones, but also for us older ones. Jesus said here at the end, why are you so afraid? Do you still not trust me? See, the disciples here, where was their focus on? What was their focus on? The storm, on the waves, the rain coming in. After what Jesus did earlier in this, feeding 5,000 people. They now saw how powerful Jesus was once he calmed the storm. How great he was. How he was Lord and um, sovereign over the storm. Now what we want to learn today is Jesus still hasn't changed. He's still the same. He's still Lord and sovereign over our circumstances and all of our situations. And we can run to him. We can fall to him even when, no matter where we are, we can go to him and we can trust in him. In 2021, situations seem uncertain. We start a new school. We might, uh, you know, go back to school for the first time after months off. You know, people get sick. People are ill. What Jesus is trying to say here, what we learn is Jesus is greater than all of these things. And we can fall on him and trust him in our circumstance. Because knowing this, it will help us find peace of mind. When my mom cuddled me after my fearfulness, I was at ease. Because I knew she was there and all was well. We can find peace. We can find strength in our times of trouble. Not because of our weakness, but because of Jesus' and his greatness. And so I hope that is an encouragement to you. As we think about who Jesus is, we can trust him. We can run to him in our most scared and fearful times. And he is always there for us. Um, let's sing, I Stand Amazed in the presence. If you want to go ahead and, and um, stand as we sing.
much. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, it will be our joy through the ages to sing of your love for us. Thank you for being there for us. Thank you for always being with us. Thank you that we can run to you and feel and are safe. Thank you that you have shown your greatness to us. And we can only just stand in amazement of your great love for us. And even when we fail, you are there for us. When we turn in repentance and faith towards you. You hold us up even when we can't stand. And so we want to say thank you today. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So this morning I'd like to draw our attention as we uh, think about Jesus' words um, this morning from Matthew chapter 5. And so we're going to read um, a very familiar passage of scripture from Matthew chapter 5 called the Beatitudes. And we will have a discussion and talk about this passage of scripture this morning. So if you do have your, if a Bible, I'm not sure if you have the same one I do, but it's page 968. Or if you have your, uh, your tablet or your phone, it's Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to read from verse 3 all the way down to verse 16. Let's read. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? For it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Thank you very much. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. May the Lord bless the reading of his scriptures. I don't know if you are like me, but every once in a while, I get down a little rabbit trail of funny memes. Anyone else find funny memes that they send to you? Anybody, where they send you a photo? Or so one of the things is you, you had one job, is one phrase, and they show a photo of a door that is built right in front of a bollard. And so the, jo the meme is, or the joke is, you had one job. Why did you put a bollard in front of a door? So obviously the door is rendered useless. You know? Or it's like a road sign when you're going down the road and you see, well, the road sign's meant to be there, but the trees have actually covered the road sign. Well, what's the point of the road sign? You can't even see it. If you are familiar with Matthew's Gospels and the chapters that lead up to this, sermon that Jesus has given to us that we call Sermon on the Mount, there were a crowd of people following Jesus, wanting to be around him. They seem eager to hear more of what Jesus had to say. I mean, what, what we gather from the passage of Scripture and Matthew's account is that these individuals 
that are here at the Sermon on the Mount have heard Jesus' message from Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Does anyone know what the message was? We see in verse 17, if you have your Bible with you, the previous chapter, from that time on it says, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come, come near. And so this crowd of people who are following him around, they had heard this message, repent and believe, and they had, and they started to follow him to want to know him more. Now, seeing this, as we read in verse 1, Jesus then takes these people to the mountainside. He sits them down. The disciples and all his followers came, and Jesus begins to speak to them. He begins to teach them. Now, these people that Jesus is speaking to are not very different from you and I. Individuals have heard the message, repent and believe. I trust those here have repented and believe. If you have not, I would encourage you to look to Jesus, repent of your sins, and trust in him. I mean, we've we've understood who Jesus is, who he is, and what he means to the world. And we want to know him more and follow him. And here Jesus gives this sermon. And he gives this sermon to his followers to be distinct and different in the world. That's what... The uh, the familiar verses of the Beatitudes. It's encouraging his followers to be different, to be distinct in the world. And now as Jesus gets to the end of what we call the Beatitudes, if we look closely, if you have your passage there, look closely at the way Matthew writes. The language here, as he records it, it changes slightly. Can anyone see the slight difference from the end of verse 10 to the beginning of verse 11. If you look, verse 11, instead of saying, blessed are the peacemakers, the meek, etc., etc., they will, for theirs is this. The difference is here in verse 11, blessed are you. When people insult You, persecute you, they falsely say all evil against you, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's almost like at the beginning he's speaking in general terms, speaking to everyone there to listen. And then it's like Jesus looks down and he makes it personal. Maybe you've been in a lecture or on a Zoom call and you're listening to the call, or you're listening to the talk, or you're listening to your teacher, and then they call out someone's name. They say, Stephen. I don't know if anybody here named David. And what do you do? Your ears perk up, and then you're listening. You're like, why did they call my name? Now, teachers and lecturers do this a lot. I remember when I was in school, before Zoom class, so if there's no teacher there, Usually you had a substitute and you got to kind of goof around a little bit. But back in the day of VCR, anybody remember what VCR tape players are? Anyone? No, so, we, yeah. so we had, when I was in, in secondary school, if a te- was my teacher, when he was absent, he recorded himself on a video camera. And so what they did, they wheeled in this, back then the televisions, they weren't nice like this. They, they were just as big wide as they were deep. You know, so there's a massive box on a big trolley, and they bring it in, and he was actually quite brilliant. He recorded himself, and uh, he started his lecture, and so, you know, as, uh, as mass and science, yeah, that's what, that was his, his, his subject. You know, you, there's no one there, you're kind of not paying attention, you're goofing around. But in the middle of his lecture, he says, David, now what do you think about that? And <laughs> like, <laughs> looking around like... And he he did call out other people's names, so I wasn't the only one. But what he did was actually brilliant. Because you're sitting there, and he grabs your attention. And sitting there, now I had my attention. He's going to call my name again. Who else is he going to call? And so we are now intently listening to what the teacher wanted to say. And very similar, I think this is what Jesus is doing. He's getting attention. Not trying to 
keeping people from zoning out. And he changes the mode here. One pastor says about this section, it's almost like he's speaking to everyone, and it's like he pauses and he looks down at a particular people, which possibly might be his closest disciples, the 11, and he says, blessed are you. Blessed are you. And he doesn't end there. He continues. He says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward. So now when we get through these verses, verses 13, it feels like Jesus is beginning to wrap up his first thing. You're distinct. You're different. And these beatitudes are given away in which his followers are needing to be distinctive in how they live. These are the characteristics that followers are meant to have. You know, it says, blessed are you who, um, let me just reread it a little bit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart, the peacemakers, etc. And God is calling his people to be glaringly different from their world. Not just in food and clothes, etc., but how people see life and how they do life. And it's these next verses, verses 13 through 16, that give us the reason why. You, all of you, here, myself, you are the salt of the earth. If we are followers, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the earth. To the world. You, if you're followers of Jesus, are a light to the world. He says, You are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And think for a moment, real quick, as we think about salt and light. When you think of salt, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What did you say? Food? Tips? Chips. Chips. Okay. What else? Anything else? Salt. Food? Cooking? All right. Salt. Now, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of light? Sea? Sun? Oh, yeah, these are, these are great things. Now, salt is a wonderful thing. Now, most people where I grew up, I grew up near Detroit, Michigan, actually the home of Domino's Pizza, Ypsilanti, Michigan. So if you see a Domino's Pizza, that's where I'm from. Anyway, but when we hear the word salt, I think of winter snow. I know that sounds really strange, but one of the main things that we do about five or six months out of the year is when it, the temperatures drop, we lay salt on the ground. For months, we have salt trucks running up and down the roads to make sure the roads are clear and the ice is melted so we can get on. Now, many think of flavor because how many like broccoli without salt? You like broccoli without salt? You're like, okay, well, fair enough, fair enough. I applaud you for that. You know, <laughs> um, But we think of flavor, chips, you know, put salt on the chips. When we hear light, I always think of my parents' house. Because they have this massive motion detector light. So if you're coming in at night and you're in the car and it's dark or early hours of the night, you ride in and it just lights up the entire neighborhood. I think an airplane could probably land on their drive because it's so bright, it's blinding. These verses here about salt and light, I believe, are statements in response to the previous verses answering why the above characteristics need to be a part of our life. Followers of Jesus need to be living out these characteristics of meekness, mercifulness, peacemakers, pure in heart, because we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. But verse 13 says, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to just be thrown away and trampled on. And Jesus' metaphor, this, this, this example of his followers being salt of the earth, he gives this statement. And then he gives the negative idea of salt. He really doesn't give us what salt does in life. He doesn't say salt gives flavor, salt preserves, salt does these things. 
But I mean, we know that salt flavors things. We know that salt brings out the good taste, which is why I like it with broccoli. You know, brings out the good in the in food. It preserves, you know, things. So that's the quality that salt brings to our world. But the interesting thing about salt is this. Salt has its own innate quality that you actually cannot find a substitute for. That's the interesting thing about salt. Now, if you're preparing a meal and the recipe calls for salt and you go to the cupboard and you don't have salt, you can't substitute it for anything else. You need the salt. Salt in its own self is what it is. Salt is its one and only quality. If it doesn't do salt or salty things, it's useless. If you don't have salt, you need actually salt. If salt doesn't enhance the flavor or do what it needs to do, what's its value? And hopefully you can see the message that Jesus is giving here. If you, are, if you are one of his followers, if we are one of his followers, and we make no effort to be different or distinct in the world in which we live, what's the point? One pastor says, if there's no effort on our part to be distinct in our world, then what we say about being a follower of Jesus is meaningless. It's pointless to people who hear us speak. Our lives ought to be lived out in such a way that is distinct. It's different than those without a reward or a hope of heaven. The kingdom and eternal life with our creator God. Living like Jesus did. Having ownership of the kingdom of heaven. Having a comfort during our time of mourning. The ability to be meek because of our greater inheritance of Christ, showing mercy and love because mercy has been shown to us. One quote I do enjoy, uh, that kind of hang on to quite a lot, is that why, what's, why do we love people? Why do we show care, care and tenderness and mercy, mercy to people? We do it because we have experienced that love, that mercy. We don't just do it for our own benefit. We do it because we have experienced it. And Jesus here is living like we know God. We've experienced the relationship with him. We've experienced his love, his mercy, his peace. And therefore, we should live out those same things. Living like we are God's children, pure in heart, finding joy and gladness, no matter our situation, because of the eternal hope that we have through Christ. See, as his followers, our lives would be just distinct from others. And it can be distinct because of our eternal hope. He says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. I read this week, our hope for an eternal tomorrow empowers us in our obedience today. Because we have a hope for an eternal tomorrow, it gives us the ability to obey and do what Jesus has done and showed us how to live. We can live like him. So our life should be salty. Our life should be flavorful. It should enhance the good in the world. Salt has one job. The substance is its one and only quality. As followers, we should be like Christ. And Jesus is saying, we are the salt to the earth. We have one job as followers, be like him. But also, Jesus said, it's not just your salt to the, of the earth, but we are the light of the world. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. Now, just like salt, light has one job. To light, to illuminate. To, you know, if there's no light, there's no light. If there's light, there's light. It only has one thing to do. A light shines to light, to make things visible. See, if there's no light... 
What is it? Well, it's just a stick of wax with a wick in it. Or it's just a glass bulb with no flint or whatever is inside of it. it. If it doesn't light, it's useless. You just throw the light bulb away. A light bulb that's burnt out, you don't keep. You throw it away and you get a new one. No one keeps that. Again, the substance of light itself is its one and only quality. It has one job to light. To, you know, if there's no light in here, you know, it's going to be a bit dark. If a room doesn't have a light on, Jesus says, followers of me, you are the light of the world. Our light is just like a city on top of the hill. It shines and it can be seen for miles. Now, London is not on a hill. I believe it's in a valley. But because of all the lights, it still can be seen from a distance. I mean, literally, last night I was driving from High Barnet into Finchley. And as you come right by High Barnet tube station, if it's a clear night, you can clearly see the lights of the city. And that's what, like nine miles away, I think it is, seven, seven or nine miles away. You can see the city because of the lights. Just like sh salt shows our distinctiveness, our value, light does the same. So Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Now think for a moment. Is there anything about this phrase, you are the light of the world, that sounds slightly familiar, maybe interesting to you? Anything? Exactly. You've read John's gospel or you've heard it. John chapter 8, you read Jesus' words saying, I am the light of the world. Now, this statement here in Jesus' sermon sounds very similar to what he says about himself. John 8, verse 12 is where it's found. I am the light of the world. And we love that verse. I mean, we put it on posters. We, we, Jesus, the light of the world. But does anyone finish the statement? The very next phrase after Jesus, is, he says, I am the light of the world. Jesus' very next word says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have light of life. His sermon here seems to be validating those words in John. That if you are a follower of me, if you are my disciple, if you have repented of your sins and trusted me, turned to me, then within you, you have a light that is different than anything else in the world that you live in. You have within you the light of life. We have Christ within us. We have his spirit. We have him with us. And we, you, are the light of the world. And we can shine that light. One thing we can see here is that we are not only uh, distinctive from the world by being like him, but we also have, when he brings out this, you are the light, there's this unity, this oneness that we have with Jesus, this, this intimacy. Look at the next few verses. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. So what do people do with light? When we walk into a dark room with the torch, we don't keep it in our pocket, but we light it. We illuminate the surrounding we shine it as much as we can so we don't injure ourselves. Light in the darkness exposes dangers. Light in darkness, it helps, it guides people, it gives people hope if they're in a, in, a, in, a, in a dark alley. Light on the front door of a house guides a person to safety. Our life, not only are we to be salt, that enhances the goodness of life in a messed up world. But we are also providing a light, pointing people to a place of rest, of joy, and eternal security. Our lives are meant to be a light hanging from the middle of a dark room, burning bright so that the room is lit up or like a lighthouse shining our, point, um, shining our light out and pointing people to the shore for safety. This is what Jesus says here in verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? So that they may see 
your good deeds and do what? Give you a pat on the back? Are our good deeds meant to give ourselves a, you know, well done, you know, say, oh, David's a great guy. You know, he's a, he's, he does a good guy. No, we are to shine to glorify our heavenly Father in heaven. The light is not meant to show off ourselves. If you're on a boat back in the day before technology and you see the lighthouse, are you like, oh, that's a view, beautiful structure of that lighthouse. No, it's the light, and you want to get the safety. The light is not meant to show off ourselves, but to show our gracious and loving Father. If we brought it, now if we brought in this out a little bit, to here at the church community, churches are meant, all of us together, to be salt and light in our community. Lighting up this part of the world, pointing people to safety, hope, pointing people to Jesus, to the one who loved you so much that he came into a dark world as light. If we follow Matthew's events, we see after Jesus was tempted by Satan and overcame that, he began to preach and he quotes from the verse in Isaiah. This is in Matthew chapter 4. He says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And as followers of Christ, we are that light to this part of the world. Matthew says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And so, my friends, today, just like salt makes food better, it makes things better, it preserves things, it helps our life, and how light provides direction, uh, protection, and hope. We are salt and light, and we must be like Jesus in our lives, showing and providing hope in our broken and messed up world, because you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light to the world. Let's sing this song. There is a hope that burns within my heart.